Hi everybody, welcome back to the channel. Um, first off, I just I want to thank everybody who has made such very kind and wonderful comments to various videos I've posted. I know probably the um, Blue Note Project 42, which I was really, really thankful to be able to be part of. I think probably has the most views out of anything and the most comments. And I feel like that, you know, obviously has led to some people watching some other videos, which I'm really, really thankful for. I am really appreciative that everybody has taken the time just to look at videos that I've posted because obviously there's tons and tons of videos on YouTube and by no means am I, uh, you know, the only person on YouTube posting videos. So I'm really grateful for you guys looking and watching at some of the videos I'm posting. I'm having so much fun doing it and interacting and commenting with people. It's been so much fun. So I'm going to continue my series now on the Have You Heard albums that I think are albums that don't get talked about enough. And I'm going to talk about an album that I'm really excited to talk about because it's one of the really few like original, original blue notes that I've been able to get because it's just one of those blue notes that ter isn't terribly expensive because I don't think a lot of people collect him. And it's a shame that they don't, but I some somewhat understand um, why they don't in a way, not because of the player, but because of the generation he was from. And that, and I want to talk a little bit about that. So the album that I'm going to talk about is the Fabulous Fats Navarro, and you can see that is Blue Note 1531, Volume One, and obviously that kind of tells you there's probably at least a Volume Two. And that, that is the case. There's only two volumes. And what is uh, pretty traditional about Blue Notes when they were starting in the, in the early 12-inch era is they were doing comps of older 10-inch or 78 stuff. So they just printed one back slick for both volumes, gave you a little kind of biography about the artist, and then described, you know, volume one, volume two. They did the same when they did the album, uh, when they comped the Monk albums, um, which were mostly all 78s, and the Miles Davis uh, albums in the early 1500 series. And so the same thing with this album. However, I think they did a, a little bit different with this album, which is one of the reasons I really like this album. And one of the things I wanted to talk about too about it. So Fats Navarro in general. Fats Navarro, obviously I'm sure you could tell from the picture, was a trumpet player. Fats Navarro was a trumpet player during the 40s. He, uh, I think he started playing around 41, 42. And at that point, he was a teenager. He was like 17, 18 years old. And the, all the recordings on this album are from between 47 to 49. And sadly, Fats Navarro died pretty much very shortly after these recordings were actually recorded. Um, he died at age 26. He actually contracted tuberculosis and, you know, tuberculosis during the forties fairly was a death sentence in a way. It was a very dangerous disease. It still is, but thankfully we live in an era where we have treatments for it. But back then in the forties, there really wasn't many treatments for it. And of what I know from reading up on Fats Navarro as well, he wasn't uh, the cleanest lifestyle. He apparently was a fairly heavy drinker. Um, he wasn't uh, the uh, lightest personality per se. Uh, supposedly he did get in decent amount of arguments with um, bandmates. And he certainly seemed to have a little bit of a harder personality, kind of similar to like Mingus's personality, where he, you know, maybe had a short fuse, so to speak. So he was originally he was kind of in that contemporary era of dizzy gillespie where dizzy gillespie had his big band and then the transition once parker came around was starting to get into the bebop era and so you got charlie parker you got dizzy gillespie they're kind of the two big giants of that era and you got fats navarro coming in and he would probably have a much larger legacy had he not died so young. But if you look at all of the kind of 
super collectible trumpet players within the kind of golden era of jazz, so to speak, you know, kind of the 55 to 65 range. This super collectible trumpet players like a Lee Morgan, um, obviously Miles Davis stuff, cat, you know, is, is very collectible. A lot of people collect that. A lot of people collect Donald Byrd. Um, a lot of people do collect Thad Jones. Clifford Brown is very collectible. Um, sadly, Clifford Brown and Thad Jones recordings probably aren't as collectible as the Lee Morgans and the Miles Davis and the Freddie Hubbards. Um, I think just, again, because it's, it's a little more commercialized. Once you're on a Blue Note and your career was such Blue Note legacy, you instantly become more collectible. Plus, you know, Miles has such a name, even to people who don't know jazz, they know the name Miles. And so obviously he is super collectible. But, you know, my point in saying all that is that all of those trumpet players, if you look at snippets on different album jackets, at some point they all mention Fats Navarro as one of their big influences. Fats Navarro influenced the next generation of trumpet players, just like Charlie Parker influenced the next generation of saxophone players. Fats Navarro and Dizzy Gillespie were kind of the two influential figures that influenced the Clifford Browns, who then the Clifford Browns influenced the Lee Morgans, who influenced the Freddie Hubbards. And so you see this lineage of trumpet players and it all kind of ties back to Dizzy Gillespie and Fats Navarro. And so I think, now, personally, I love this era of jazz as well as the hard bop and the bebop errors. And so I love Fats Navarro's work. I think he's a phenomenal trumpet player. And you can, if you listen to his recordings, you can see why he was so influential on the next generation. In saying that, I do understand why people don't collect Fats Navarro as much, because all of his recordings were all during the 78 era. And, and by 78 era, I mean, and I'm sure people in the VC know what I mean, but, you know, when albums were 78 RPMs and you can only fit one track on one side and one track on the other side, basically singles. They would record singles and they would go to radio stations so that they could play them. They would go in, uh, you know, whatever type of um, DJing type capacities that they would have at that point. They would play singles. They'd be 78s. And they, you know, some of them would be on a smaller 78. Some of them were on those big shellac 78s um, that, you know, look like a huge Frisbee. And, uh, I actually have one shellac that I accidentally got. Um, I had gotten a box of free records once that I, I basically just got to get some covers to use for shipping. And uh, in it was actually a shellac 78. And I've kept it just for the sake of kind of having it. But I don't even have equipment that could play a 78. Um, they don't really make too many tables that play 78s anymore. Um, so... You know, in saying that, I understand why Fats Navarro wasn't as collectible. All of his all of his tracks were all just tracks. That's what they were. They were individual tracks that were released on 78s. However, here's the thing that I think that's really unique about this album and the Volume 2. And I don't own the Volume 2. I'm still trying to track it down in decent shape. It's really hard to find these in decent shape. Most of them are fairly trashed. Um, but I want to show you the back cover because it actually has the track listing for volume one and volume two. And here's the really interesting thing. If you look at it, it's Our Delight, Alternate Master, and then Our Delight. The Squirrel, Alternate Master, Squirrel, Chase, Alternate Master, Chase. You, know, you get the idea down the line. But then if you look at the actual players, you could see what they did with this comp. They actually made it where one side of the album is one session. And the other side is a different session, just like you would have with a regular, you know, 33 RPM album. You would see that for the most part, now there's only like one exception, and that's obviously because of space. You know, this last track was actually this session. Um, but you get the idea. They tried their best 
to make each side one session and the other side one session. And I really appreciated that because it get at least it gets you into hearing how that band was playing on that day and how they were feeding off of each other. Because if you you know if you if you've played in a band setting, you know that you feed off of each other. What one player does influences what another player does, at least in the good bands. You know, obviously when you know you look at bands one of the things you want to see is that they, you know, you use the term tight, that the band is tight. They, you feel like they're playing together. They're not just playing the same song. They're actually playing in a unit, playing the same song. You know, you don't just have a guitar player doing his thing and a drummer doing their thing. They're all playing cohesively towards a goal. And the goal is, you know, that song. And I, I really liked that because you could get the sense of what each kind of band was doing in that session. And that's what I really like about it. In general, what you're going to notice if you listen to any Fats Navarro, and I really, really encourage you to go listen to Fats Navarro, is he had a really bright tone. He was definitely one of those players that was um, a fairly intense player. You know, he was going to be um, definitely during a head you know, and traditionally, like, the head of the song is, like, the melody of the song, and then you go into a solo, and during a head, he definitely played, you know, more cohesively with his bandmates, but on his actual solos, you know, they're fairly, they're bright tone, they're, they're very, um, in-your-face type solos, they're not kind of the melancholy, good mood, slow, you know, not even slow, but like good mood, relaxed, laid back, you know, type of a solo you'd hear on Someday My Prince Will Come by Miles Davis or Porgy and Best by Miles Davis. This is definitely more in the vein, and, and really you got to say Lee Morgan was more in the vein of Fats Navarro, but it's more in the vein of that type of a player where it's, you know, you feel the energy exuberating out of the trumpet and they're really blowing that trumpet and getting, you know, the most they can out of those notes. And, um, that's what I, that's what I really like about Fats Navarro's tone and just his, his overall playing is much more, he had something to say. And I really enjoy players like that, that have something to say and they're not just kind of going through motions. And that's why I like Fats Navarro so much. I love this era of music in general. Um, and there's some great players on this. It's not just Fats Navarro. If you look at um, if you look at side one of this album, you got Fats Navarro on trumpet. Eddie uh, Ernie Henry was a great sax player of his day. Charlie Rouse, really really great trumpet uh, t uh, tenor sax player, played with Monk for a long time. Um, one of the few musicians who stayed with Monk for a long time. Like I said, Ted Dameron um, is the piano player of this. Nelson Boyd is on bass. I don't personally know who that, I don't know him. Shadow Wilson was a tremendous drummer. Many of the modern modern era jazz players like Art Blakey, like um, Max Roach, like Mel Lewis, they would say Shadow Wilson was a big influence on them. Shadow Wilson was an incredible drummer. Then you look at side two of volume one, Fats Navarro's on trumpet, Sonny Rollins is on, on sax, Sonny Rollins, tenor sax. This is one of the or very early Sonny Rollins recordings. Um, Bud Powell, one of the great, great piano players in the history of music. Um, Tommy Porter was a very good bass player. And Roy Haynes, Roy Haynes was, you know, very prominent in the 60s. Roy Haynes became huge. The 50s too. But Roy Haynes really made his name um, late 50s into the early 60s. And this is some of the really early Roy Haynes, Sonny Rollins recordings. So in and of himself, this is history, this is jazz history of musicians who played with Fats Navarro who could go back to him and, you know, go back to that time and say, yes, I played with him and he influenced the next generation of players that I'm playing with. And that's so special to be able to see the lineage of these players and that's why i really encourage you to go look at 
Fats Navarro. Listen to some of his stuff. Listen to Ted Dameron as well. He was a great piano player. Pud, Bud Powell was one of the great piano players in the history of music, jazz and music. Anything by Bud Powell is fantastic. And I don't have any Bud Powell records um, just because I haven't been able to find too many in decent shape. And if they are, they're like older. Um, any of the ones that are in decent shape are still like older represses and they still people have wanted a lot of money for. So I haven't bought them just because I felt like they were overpriced. But eventually I need to get some Bud Powell records into my collection because um, he was such a great piano player. So go check out Fats Navarro. Check out Bud Powell too. Bud Powell doesn't get talked about as much as he should. Bud Powell's great. Fats Navarro's great. And I really encourage you to look him out up. So thank you for your time. And I hope you guys enjoyed the video. I'll see you next time.